right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the meeting of the mayor and council. It's uh, Monday, October 3rd. We have with us tonight Pastor Carolyn Vincent. Vincent with High Point and Christian Tabernacle, 3269 Old Concord Road. I'd like to invite you up. and Everybody please rise for the uh, invocation and pledge. Thank you. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, our help in ages past, we humbly bow before you this evening to pray your divine blessing upon this city council meeting. We pray that you will grace us with your presence as the business of the people is discussed this evening. Let each issue be addressed with purpose, wisdom, and clarity of thought. Give each speaker and each representative wisdom and insight as to their decision making. Bless Mayor Norton and each elected official as they continue to serve this great city. Let the city of Smyrna continue to be a beacon of light, not only in the state of Georgia, but in these United States. Further, we would pray for those tonight in the state of Florida who have suffered great loss. We ask that you comfort all that mourn give provision to those in need and aid them in their effort to rebuild. For we realize tonight that it is because of the Lord's mercies that we too are not consumed. Finally, we pray the peace of God over this city. Shield the city of Smyrna from violence, divisiveness, and discord. Let us continue to live together in love, harmony, and peace. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for being with us tonight. We appreciate it. Item two is agenda changes. We don't have any agenda changes tonight. Uh, item three is the mayoral report. We have a few items, the first of which uh, we're so proud that Miss Jennifer Matasic, who is at Argyle Elementary, was named Teacher of the Year, and I believe she's here tonight, and we have a proclamation. Come on up. Come on up. Be recognized. I got a soft spot for Argyle because Laura and I, that was one of our first, my wife Laura and I, the first things we did in Smyrna was volunteer with a second grade class over there, and we loved it. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to our education chairman, Mayor Pro Tem Tim Gould, to read the proclamation for you. Thank you, Mayor Norton. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. And, and I chaired the education committee along with uh, Council Member Wheaton and uh, Councilmember uh, Member Wilkinson also, so it's a pleasure to have you here with us, and it's such a big part of our education, obviously such a big part of our city, so thank you for all, all that you do. So I'll read the proclamation and then come on down there, we'll get a, get a picture, okay? Okay. So hold on, let me get my glasses. Need them now. A proclamation by the mayor of the city of Smyrna in recognition of Jennifer Matasic, Cobb County School District Teacher of the Year. Whereas Ms. Jennifer Matasic, a second grade teacher at Smyrna Argyle Elementary School was named Cobb County School District's Teacher of the Year on August 23rd, 2022. And whereas Ms. Matasic was chosen among more than 7,000 teachers, the district employees, and will now represent Cobb County, the state's second largest school district at the state level Teacher of the Year competition. And whereas in August, Jennifer started her ninth year of teaching and her fifth year at Argyle Elementary. During her time at Argyle, she has been a site liaison and coach for the Argyle Girls on the Run team, started an after-school enrichment, enrichment STEM club, and initiated a school-wide effort to send letters to airmen at Lockland Air Force Base during the holiday season. She has also been involved in several district level committees such as Priority Standards Committee, Mathematics Standards Revisions Committee, and a graduate of the Cobb Teachers Leader Academy. And whereas, Jennifer was born and raised in Batavia, Illinois, where she attended elementary, middle, and high school, and got her first teaching job in the same school district. She attended Northern Illinois University, 
where she received her undergraduate degree in elementary education with a Spanish minor and ESOL endorsement. Jennifer graduated from Thomas University in May with her graduate degree in curriculum and instruction. And whereas Ms. Matasik says, quote, I just feel an immense honor and I feel this immense responsibility to not only represent Argyle very well, but to represent the whole, whole county, to be a voice for all teachers and all students in the county this year, and just to show how, how many small but mighty Argyle is. Now, therefore, I, Derek Norton, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Smyrna in the state of Georgia, do, hi, do hereby proclaim October 3rd, 2022, as a day of recognition for Jennifer Matasik for her personal and professional accomplishments, leading to being recognized as a Cobb County School District Teacher of the Year 22-23. Congratulations. We're so proud of you. Anything you want to say? Thank you all so much for the immense honor. I really appreciate it. We appreciate all you do. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's the mascot for uh, Northern Illinois. The Huskies. The Huskies. Yeah. yeah. I should have known that. Thank you Thanks, all so Jennifer. much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you again. All right, next on our agenda is proclamation and recognition of the 40-year anniversary of Cumberland Diamond Exchange. Mark, Rhonda, team, y'all want to come up? Mark and Rhonda are not only friends and their family friends, but I'm also one of their customers. Got Laura's ring with them, so... And, and the one after it, after she lost the first one. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. Uh, I'm going to read this proclamation, and then I'll have you introduce your team and, and say anything you want to say. A proclamation by the mayor of the city of Smyrna, Cumberland Diamond Exchange, in recognition of 40 years. Whereas we are proud to recognize and honor Cumberland Diamond Exchange, a Smyrna business for more than four decades. And whereas Cumberland Diamond Exchange was established in 1982 by brothers Wayne and Mark Jacobson, and is now owned and operated by Mark and Rhonda Jacobson. And whereas Cumberland Diamond Exchange has occupied the corner of Spring Road and Cumberland Boulevard in Smyrna since it first opened. And whereas Cumberland Diamond Exchange was recognized as the 2015 Cobb County Small Business of the Year, the 2016 Jeweler of the Year for the Southeastern United States, and in 2017, Rhonda Jacobson was named Smyrna Citizen of the Year. And whereas since 2000, the Cumberland Diamond Exchange has also been among the top 5% of independent specialty jewelers in the U.S. based on revenue. And whereas Cumberland Diamond Exchange strongly believes in community involvement, they are involved in more than 40 charitable nonprofit organizations in Metro Atlanta, including the Smyrna Public Safety Foundation, Wellstar Foundation, Safe Path Children's Advocacy Center, and the Cobb Library Association, just to name a few. And whereas the mission statement of Cumberland Diamond Exchange is committed to go the extra mile, dedicated to exceed your expectations and experience to buy wisely and sell professionally. Now, therefore, I, Derek Norton, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Smyrna in the state of Georgia, do hereby proclaim October 3rd, 2022, as a day of recognition for Cumberland Diamond Exchange and encourage all city residents, officials, and staff to congratulate them on their 40th anniversary and their many accomplishments and contributions to the community. Thank you, Derek. I've been in Smyrna either living or our business since 1977, so I think I've been through three mayors, um, and I like what you're doing here. Y'all are doing a great job, so thank you. But I would like to introduce, um, I guess, my founding partner, my brother Wayne. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> my awesome wife, Rhonda, um, who we would have never grown as much as we've grown if it wasn't for her. She's been with us 
been with me for 37 years, been at Cumberland Diamond Exchange for 38 years, and she'll tell you we've been married for 76 years, I think. <laughs> Double time. Our key management team, Prentice Johnson, has been with us almost two decades. Um, his leadership has um, <laughs> he's helped us grow immensely. Um, his partner, Richard Rahim, has also been with us almost two decades, and um, their leadership has really been um, strong for us. We appreciate it. And my daughter, Melissa, who is now our marketing manager um, and also a Smyrna resident. And a new mom. And a new mom. <laughs> And I think, uh, and, Leah, and Leah Johnson, um, our office manager, has been with us a decade and a half, we determined today. And she's married to Prentice over here. But um, it's just an honor to be a part of this great city and watching it grow and all the new developments. And um, so I guess 40 years is a long time, and we intend to be here for a lot longer. But thank you all so much. We're so pleased you do business here and, and all that you do for the community. It's really remarkable. We, we really appreciate it. I'm going to come down and we'll get a picture, okay? Awesome. okay. Thank Give you them a round of applause. kids by the store. <laughs> Let's see. All right, next is item C, and it's to recognize Blair Berenson for Eagle Scout Project in, in Smyrna Parks. And I had the opportunity and pleasure to um, go out to some of the parks and see the work that you did uh, putting together the little free libraries. I'm going to read a little bit about uh, the project and about Blair, and then I'm going to turn it over to Travis Lindley, who is the only Eagle Scout, or maybe, no, not the only Eagle Scout. There's another Eagle Scout. There's, we got two Eagle Scouts on this, which out of eight of us, that's, pre that's pretty good. That's, all right. Uh, Blair's a junior at Campbell High School future Eagle Scout from Troop 220 in Smyrna, based out of Life Church. He chose to fundraise, build, paint, install, and stock 10 little free libraries across 10 parks in Smyrna for his Eagle Scout project. And he worked closely with Richard Garland on the project, and I'm sorry that you had to do that. Blair will be in attendance along with his parents. Uh, I guess your parents are here, and they were out there with us to getting the um, photos taken. And Jay Barrett Carter member of the Smyrna Parks and Rec Commission, representing Ward 7. And then we've got the scouts from Troop 220 uh, here uh, as well. So I'll turn it over to Travis and then our other Eagle Scout, if you'd like to make some comments too, you can do that. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Blair, if, if you don't mind, come on up to the, uh, the podium. Thank you. And I, I first want to congratulate you on this high honor, and I'll come back to you. But I want to ask all of the Boy Scouts and the leaders to stand up and be recognized as well. Thank you. As, uh, as I'm sure Councilman Wheaton will agree, it is great to see Scouts still alive and well today. So thank you all for all you do and for what, uh, what you're doing here tonight. Uh, as, a, as an Eagle Scout, uh, my colleague here to the right, 
noted that uh, it must have been a real long time ago, which was was, was kind uh, after a long Monday, but uh, it was. And I can tell you as a, as a life experience, what you've learned in uh, completing this project will be with you uh, throughout uh, your career, throughout college, and uh, as life sort of takes off. So you're off uh, on a good note. Um, tell us a little bit, uh, the mayor stole some of our thunder, but uh, tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you worked on around Smyrna, if you will. Sure, so uh, I built 10, uh, built as well as painted with the group of other scouts as well other volunteers, 10 little free libraries around uh, Smyrna, collected books, put the books in there, but each one is at a different park, each one is uh, painted a different theme, so we have a music one, we have a sports one, we have school emojis, we have all sorts of different ones, and I believe all of the parks except for maybe one or two in Smyrna now all have little free libraries. So we did fill pretty much all of the parks with the education that the county deserves, or the city deserves. Well, that is indeed great. Well, thank you again for that, and thanks to everybody that uh, helped out. Are your parents here yes, with you this evening? Ah, oh, there they are. Well, good evening. Thank you all, and congratulations. I'll turn it over to Mr. Wheaton. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to say congratulations, Blair. I'm, I remember you from much younger days. Uh, and it's good to see so many folks that I got to hang out with quite a bit over the years over in Life Church. We spent a lot of time together. You know, scouting is just an amazing thing. And, you know, I've always said and advocated as much as I can to, for people to get involved in scouts. And it's such a pleasure, such a joy to see um, those free libraries popping up and see that community engagement. And to know that that comes from you, just like, you know, Councilmember Lindley Sled said, that experience, that coordination, that organization takes a lot of work. I definitely understand that and know that, um, but that will go a long way for you in life. And just take all those memories, all the fun, all the hard work, all the complications that I know you're very familiar with along the way with scouting, use those experiences to grow um, and you'll do exceedingly well in life. So thank you for your service. Thank you for what you did for the community. And certainly wanna thank all of my, my fellow scouts and Eagle Scouts as well in, in the room. Councilman Lindley has a recognition for you, and uh, Dr. Wheaton, why don't you go down and get a photo with him, too? Penny, this might be the last picture, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Now, I usually say this after proclamations, y'all are welcome to stay, but you don't have to. Okay. The only other things I have under the mayoral report, um, I want to remind everybody that this Saturday is our 150th birthday celebration here in Smyrna. We're going to be having events all day from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. We've got, it's a culture and spirit theme. Uh, I think we've got 20s music, 50s music country, bluegrass, we got a Jimmy Buffett tribute band, a belly dancer, and then we end it with uh, Toad the Wet Sprocket and Train on a stage across Atlanta Road. Got three stages, um, food, um, it's, it's going to be a great party and it ends with fireworks at the end. So I hope all of you will come out, it's all free, free shows. Uh, and then the following Saturday, October 15th from 5 to 9, we have our Hispanic Heritage Celebration and I hope to see all of you out uh, for that. With that, uh, I'll conclude the mayoral report and we'll go to land issues, zonings, and annexations.
the first item is item A, 2022-481. This is a public hearing. This is to appeal the denial by the License and Variance Board for variance request V22-055, allow encroachment into the 75-foot impervious service area setback, lot 696 at 1921 Sadler Drive, Eddie Carr by Wayne S. Melnick, who resides at 1921 Sadler Drive Southeast, Smyrna, Georgia, 30080, as filed with the city clerk's office on September 1st, 2022, at 412 p.m. via electronic email. Mr. Bennett, any background, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The applicant is requesting a variance to allow encroachment into the city's 75-foot impervious surface area setback to allow for the construction of a new swimming pool at 1921 Sadler Drive. The city stream buffers are controlled by Chapter 46, Article 6. The property was originally platted in 2006 after the stream buffer ordinance was enacted in 2005, and no mitigation plan has been proposed for the property. The hardship is self-created as the lot of record has existed after the stream buffer protection ordinance was adopted. Without a mitigation plan to offset any potential effects of the buffer encroachment, Staff cannot assume that there would be no negative impacts to adjacent properties if approved. Community development recommended the denial of the 75-foot impervious surface area setback encroachment. The variance requests were denied by a vote of 3-0 at the August 24th, 2022 meeting of the License and Variance Board. The homeowner, Wayne S. Melnick of 1921 Sadler Drive has appealed that decision. And this is a public hearing, but I'll turn it over to staff first uh, for any presentation you have, and then we'll go from there. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, Caitlin Crow, um, Planner One over at Community Development. So um, as Mr. Bennett said, the um, variance case is V22-055. This is an appeal that you will be hearing tonight. The original applicant was Eddie Carr, a Bella Reed Luxury Pools. It was originally heard back on August 24th by the License and Variance Board was recommended for denial by the board um, of a vote with 3-0 and is now being heard by you this evening. So this is a um, just an overall view of the Stonecrest Manor neighborhood. I have highlighted it as you can see in teal, um, but just showing how each of these homes is fairly close to Saddler Drive, the main road through the subdivision. So this was the proposed site plan that was included with their variance application. So this is the existing house. You can see it is pushed towards the road. The proposed pool location directly behind the home. Then we have the 50 foot undisturbed stream buffer in the rear, as well as the 75 foot impervious surface area setback. You can see that the pool is currently um, going through the middle of that area. Thus, there is the variance to encroach into that 75 foot impervious. So as you can see from this uh, site plan, there's a stream that does run through the northern boundary of the property, and there's also a 15-foot drainage easement just north of the deck um, in between that house and proposed pool. So the applicant is proposing to build a 691-square-foot in-ground swimming pool, as well as accompanying decking in the rear yard. Due to the existing stream, the rear yard is encumbered by the state's 25-foot undisturbed stream buffer the city's 50-foot undisturbed stream, excuse me, undisturbed stream buffer, and the city's 75-foot impervious setback. So within the stream buffer protection ordinance, variances may be granted with several items, two of which I'm gonna point out today. Where a parcel was platted prior to the effective date of the article, which was back in 2005, and provided the variance has mitigation measures to offset any effects of the proposal. This property originally was zoned in Cobb County back in 2004 and then annexed into the city in 2006. The city stream buffer ordinance was again enacted in 2005, a year prior to the annexation and subsequent development of this neighborhood. Due to the physical constraints of the site, including that size of the lot and existing home, there is no feasible area to install proper mitigation on the property to offset this disturbance. After a site visit back on August 15th of this year, the assistant city engineer made the determination that the 25 foot and 50 foot undisturbed buffers are also currently properly vegetated. So a buffer remediation plan is also not applicable to the site. 
So without a mitigation plan to offset any of the potential effects of the buffer encroachment, staff cannot assume that there'll be no negative impacts to adjacent properties and continue to recommend um, denial of this. Um, I do have Assistant City Engineer Frank Caruba with me to answer any questions about the mitigation plan or any of the visits he made to the property. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from Council for Caitlin? <clears throat> Mr. Welch. Can we bring back that photo we were just looking at, or the uh, drawing? The original um, the site plan. Well, here's the site plan. Did you want the GIS photo? That's it right there. Okay. Uh, is there a um, concrete deck around the pool, and I'm assuming north is to the top of the page? Uh, correct, yes. So, yes, that you can kind of see that gray area. That is the decking, but that is the full scope of the pool. The, the what is the decking? The um, I know it's kind of hard to see, but and I apologize. I'm getting a little close. Um, the blue area. The blue area, um, just around it, I don't know if you can see that gray area, that, that is the concrete decking around it. One to two foot. Correct, that's what was shown as part of the plans, correct. And is the, my understanding of the, what, what we're losing here is 288 square feet of impervious area, or pervious area, is that correct? I don't know the exact square footage, but I think somebody quoted the other night 288 square feet. Um, Council, it's 282. It's 282. 288. 282. 286. 286. I'm sorry. 282. Um, we're good. 286. <laughs> so we're not really adding any any area that's going to additional area that's going a hard surface is going to drain to this area. We're just eliminating that 286 square feet. Yes, so we are eliminating the 282 square feet of what was currently undisturbed buffer and is now going to be, or excuse me, um, impervious surface area setback um, okay. and is now going to be that pool location. Okay. Um, I just, my opinion, I, I, don't, I don't see that as being a, a, a really big detriment to the to the 50 and the 25 foot or the 75 foot setback in there. I don't, I don't think we're gonna cause a lot of a lot of problems provided that the remaining area where construction occurs is um, properly restored. Uh, now, that's just my opinion, but if, if we're not, just my opinion, the, the 280 something square feet is not gonna it's not going to make a whole lot of difference on that property. Um, so, yeah, I'm done. Caitlin, could you bring up the um, the neighborhood map? Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so all the houses on the north side of the street there uh, bump, bump up against that street, existing stream, right? Correct. They all have okay. the same or similar conditions. And I know we don't know the the design of each one of those lots relative to what would be allowable with the just here but it would seem like other lots would be similar in, in challenges probably give or take correct give or take right so um one of the things i've seen in some of our decision making is precedence right and um so that causes me a little bit of concern so if if this does get approved other folks in the neighborhood reasonably would expect that they could do it in their neighbor in, the, in their homes also, right? And so we see some of the older parts of the city where we've encroached on the stream buffers over time for a very variety of reasons, where the really that the accumulation of those encroachments does cause a, a noticeable and noteworthy impact on folks downstream. So each individual one is probably not a material change, but as they grow in number, it does turn into a material change. So I think that's probably the, the part of the principle that you all are standing on, right? This is the this is the buffer that's been in place and there's reasons for that buffer. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Just a quick question for you. Councilmember Gould kind of made 
a good observation about sort of the accumulation. But can we be, just to be very clear about what we're talking about here, the, not necessarily a long protracted explanation, but the purpose, the goal of these buffers and what happens if they kind of start to go away or if they're kind of picked off one by one yeah. in this area particularly. If you don't mind, I will um, call up Frank Caruba to answer that. He'll Perfect. have a better expertise on that. Perfect. Oops. <laughs> yes, I do. When do we start swearing in staff? <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. Hey, you're, you're the attorney. I'm just making sure. To answer your question, the intent of your impervious setback and the 25 and the 50-foot stream buffers are to minimize the impacts of stormwater runoff. By doing that, you're going to reduce erosion and sedimentation. You're going to improve water quality as well as your habitat corridors. Those are the intents. And the same reason as part of your ordinance, not your, your ordinance as well, you have a max impervious cover per lot. Again, the intent is to minimize the, in, the adverse impacts of stormwater runoff. Anybody else? Any other questions for staff? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to invite the applicant up now. State your name and address for the record and... Uh, Can I stand in my place as an attorney? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been put under oath twice in my career, so it's all good. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Wayne Melnick. Um, I am the applicant slash appellee or appellant in this particular circumstance, I suppose. Um, if I had known it was Eagle Scout night, I would have worn my Eagle Dad pin. Um, I've raised two boys, both Troop 444 here in Cobb County, both Eagle Scouts as well, so I, I truly appreciate everything that you all did as well. Trust me, I remember going through the Eagle Scout projects also. Um, my wife, Laura, who's here with me tonight, and I applied for this, and I wanna, I wanna go back over the background just a little bit of this because the context wasn't provided, and I think the context for the application is important. When we moved into the neighborhood, the first thing that we had to do was we had to obtain approval of the Homeowners Association. To do that, we had to submit the site plan along with everything else that was required, including the approval of our, excuse me, the approval of our immediate neighbors on either side of us, 1923 and 1919. We obtained those approvals from both of our neighbors. We submitted to the Homeowners Association. The Homeowners Association approved the application. At that point, we applied for the variance. The variance is more challenging than the homeowners association approval because it requires the approval of all of the adjacent properties. And the way the city of Smyrna defines the adjacent properties is it's not just the houses next to you, but it's any property that touches upon your property. Now, that includes the people on the back side of the stream and interestingly enough, the people on the opposite side of the street also, because our property sticks out just slightly where we touch on to the property lines of the people across the street. So we ended up needing six approvals. Those signatures had to be submitted with the variance application also. Um, I'll admit, it gave me an opportunity to meet my neighbors that I hadn't really had a chance to do at that point. And, and now I know all of my neighbors. I have their contact information. One of them took my Atlanta United tickets um, for the last game. But we obtained all of those signatures as well. And that's important for the council to consider because we've spoken to those people that would be concerned about the erosion and the immediate effect upon their property, especially the people that are immediately downstream from us at 1919. We obtained all of those signatures and all of those approvals that were needed. So the people that would be directly and immediately impacted by this variance if it were granted were in favor of it and still are in favor of it. Councilman Welch picked up directly on the point that I was going to make, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but what we are talking about is a total, including the concrete decking, we're talking about a total amount of 715 square feet. That's what's at issue here. And of that 715 square feet, 433 square feet is outside of the variance. So we're talking about 282 square feet is the effect. And as Councilman noted, 
it really just doesn't have a big effect on things. The pool to the creek, what we're talking about, is 77 feet. But just as important is that there is a 30-foot decline that goes from the back line of our property that's usable down into the creek. And as you heard staff say a little bit earlier, that's entirely a vegetated area. The importance of that, I'm going to go to your question, Councilman Wheaton. The importance of that is that any water runoff that occurs that heads towards that creek isn't just rushing down a hill and has no block to it whatsoever. It's broken up by the vegetation. So the ability of water to carry sedimentation, which was the concern that was issued by the engineer here, doesn't exist because the vegetation slows the water down and gives it the ability to be absorbed back into the land itself. Again, 77 feet differential from the pool decking for which we are using permeable decking also. So it's not just concrete in and of itself. That will have the ability to absorb as well. But 77 feet of travel along with 30 feet down that's going as well. Staff's comment was there's no feasible area to install mitigation. And therefore, and this is I think the important part of what they said, staff cannot assume no negative effect on neighboring property. But they can't prove that there's a negative effect. That's the whole thing. It's an assumption on their part. What we're talking about is 282 square feet. If you think about it in, in other terms, um, that's a room that's 16 by 16, give or take a little bit on it. So think of a relatively moderate sized bedroom that you all might have in your house. That's the total amount of incorporation that we're talking about that's at issue in this case. So respectfully, I, I, I understand the concern. It's not that there's not a wanting to do something about it. It's that the particular challenges to use the properties was discussed by staff just don't allow for the mitigation. But in the end, we're talking about a fairly small amount, 282 square feet, for which the property design itself alleviates the concerns. The last question I want to bring up, Councilman Gould, goes to your point. We talk about precedence, and, and I understand what you're saying definitively on that point. What I would say in response to that, property was platted in 2006, annexed afterwards. The properties were built in 2008. My house was built in 2008. Um, that's, when, that's when the market crashed, you'll remember. Mm -hmm. The builder held on to some of the property and continued and got back to finishing the neighborhood in 2014. In answer to your question, to my knowledge, on the research that I've done, there has been no other application within Stonecrest Manor for a variance, at least on the north side of the street, of this kind. So the concern that this is going to, to, to use the legal term, open the floodgates, it isn't there, at least not at this time, because this is the first and the only one that's been done, and that subdivision is now 13 years old. If the counselor, Your Honor, has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them at this time. I have a question. This is the, in your presentation, that's the first time I believe, and I could be mistaken, that's the first time I've heard that it's permeable decking. Tell me a little bit about what you're using. And this, this is, I, to this me is that, from Bellary. To me, that makes, a, that, that makes a difference. If we're talking about impermeable surface, impermeable surface, but you're using permeable. We suggested permeable. It was not accepted on the city engineer. It's, a, it's a, accepted on other jurisdictions, for instance, Brookhaven. Um, Mr. Kruba said it's not acceptable on city of Smyrna, but um, we would be happy. Tell me about that. It's not an accepted material. Is that? He's. They're saying that. Yeah, they're saying that you did not approve that material. Is that? Yes. Please. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Up. Sorry to okay. make you get up and go back now. Permeable pavers, previous concrete, is an acceptable form of mitigation. And in fact, we used previous concrete at a house on Memory Lane. But if you read the Georgia Stormwater Management Manual, there are going to be some parameters set for that. It has to be installed, designed as per the manual. 
I would not recommend, not that it is the manual, installing pervious pavers right next to the house. So you have to be a certain distance from the house. If you install pervious pavers right next to the house or right on the property line, well, the that's causing infiltration. Yeah. So that could have a negative impact on your foundation, your basement, or your the adjacent properties, because I mean, they're very close. Could they not put pervious uh, brick on the back side of the pool and concrete up by the house? They had not submitted any any plans. Show, show me that picture again. Can y'all bring that picture up again? <coughs> Sorry to May add one point in on that also while we're talking about it. Um, the manual that he's talking about, the recommendation on the pavers relative to the house, as I understand it, is 15 foot minimum. I believe that's correct. Right. Okay. We're talking about 14.5 feet. Caitlin, can you pull up where it goes into the buffer? So on that, on the right side of the picture that I'm looking at, over by the spa, that's the closest area to the house, correct? Or from the spa to the back pool, that's the closest area to the house? The left side. It should be the down its left side. Okay. Yeah, right here. I'm just trying to. Yes. Okay. So I'm sorry, where? Porky's point, I'm just trying to see if there's a way to put impermeable close to the house and then oh, we, permeable. That's absolutely among what we're looking at. Where the, uh, um, Frank, where the impervious pavers or potential pavers, where, where, where would they be located in the drawing? They were not submitted on the drawings. It, I'm sorry. No. They were not submitted. The mit mitigation was not submitted. When I'm reviewing this, what I'm looking for is say in this particular case, the area that's in the impervious setback is 282 square feet. I'm looking for mitigation that provides a reduction in stormwater runoff for that 282 square feet, as well as water quality. That's 80% reduction in total suspended solids for a 1.2 inch rain event. There's a list of various BMPs that can be installed, such as a dry well, an infiltration trench, uh, bio slopes, pervious pavers, pervious concrete, and by installing the, for example, with the pervious pavers, you're making that area now, it's not impervious, it's now pervious. So they don't have room to do anything else, but they would have room to do some of the pervious pavers. Well, they haven't, you know, I gave them a list of possibilities, but that's not, the, that's not an exclusive list. You can use anything else, but nothing was submitted to review. If they have a different solution we'd be happy to look at it but we have not received you know I, I don't know anything about pools but as small of an area as that is could, i mean we're, we're talking two feet could we not slope that area back to the pool i mean and the pool gets rainwater anyway uh is that a possibility the pool itself the water level is regulated correct and when it gets above the recommended water level, the water, be careful, <laughs> is then pumped out, correct? Onto the land, onto the property. So the, it's not holding any extra rainwater. It's just the water that's in the pool. You get a heavy rain, okay. that water will be then pumped out. But, that, that but again, it's only 282 square footage. And I just want to go back to the pervious versus impervious. We brought it up during the variance, and it was denied this idea. Uh, I also would like to bring up that including, if we're talking about the maximum impervious <coughs> of the lot, because each lot has a maximum, including the pool and the decking and the equipment bed, we are coming up to 41%, and the maximum allowed for this lot is 4 to 5. Something Did you, to think about. So uh, one thing Frank mentioned. 45% outside of the buffers and the impervious. Area. One thing Frank mentioned, uh, no mitigation plans were provided. Do you have some concepts of, you just mentioned one that kind of, a little bit difficult throwing that out now as a potential change, right? Did you present that idea to staff for, the, for them to review? It, for me, it was not right. on the plan. It was, it was discussed yeah. at the permit hearing, but because because so would you because also sorry go ahead sorry. because the city of Smyrna 
engineering department doesn't recognize that as a viable um, mitigation factor, yeah. it was dismissed outright. So I would suspect that's an area of possible variance, right? May right. I could comment? One of the recommendations by Eddie Carr, was he yeah. at the meetings, yeah. that the pervious pavers would be under the existing deck. The existing deck is impervious. The existing wooden deck, that's considered yeah. to be impervious. It, it just seems to me that there might be opportunity to work work on this a little bit more, and I would hate to ask you to come back. And this is this is in Tim's district, but, but there's a conversation over here talking about you know if there wasn't a specific remedy put forward that is acceptable, maybe there's some is there room to work on it more? Or is right. It, I mean, Frank, if, they, if folks came up with and Rusty, if they came back with a different plan that maybe obviously it doesn't fit the box that we have right now, but it allows some more further discussion. Is that something that's worthwhile from your perspective? And I'd be looking to see what the mitigation would be for the 282 square feet. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of water. Um, when we were talking about rainfall into the pool and pumping from the pool. That's why the pool is considered to be impervious. Yeah, could we, it, even if it pumps in a different direction, still? The, it's, it, the water is going to have, it's going to leave the site. Uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, so they, it's, they it's could a, pump to a, a storm drain in front of their house, for that matter. I mean, no, 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 want to go to the sewer. <laughs> Put that in the bad idea bucket, Glenn. Um, oh, but I, mean, no, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm like Derek. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah, trying to find a way to yeah, trying to I find mean, a that, way to that, make it work. That is something that, that if it's presented, we could review. And so, because um, if, if it goes to the city <clears throat> storm drain in the front in the catch basin, I would then have to verify where is that water going when it leaves the catch basin. So Frank, if I could on, say, proximity to the foundation for some of these mitigation tools, right? So ultimately, they would bear the risk since it's closer to their home foundation versus somebody, somebody probably versus their neighbor, I would suspect. I don't know the distances to the neighbor. They're close. But is that, or maybe there's some other location there. Is that something, is that an area that we have some flexibility on or in the big scope of things? I mean, you'd, you'd make your recommendation, of course, right? Um, but does that give them some more flexibility on, on their design? So I guess what I'm getting at is you throw some, some ideas out here that you know, we haven't seen, but per, is it worthwhile going back and just, you know, you, go, you offering up some mitigation plans and seeing if uh, get the get the feedback on them. Because it's not, it's not a, fair, so to speak, for staff, right? If you haven't, I haven't offered anything, they can't, you know, you know. And again, we are talking about 282 square footage of rainwater. It's not the 691. It's just 282 square. Then it's a very small mitigation plan. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the only mitigation that, that I'm looking. At. All right, are we are we okay with getting everybody in a room and trying to work this out and then bring it back? Is that okay? Rusty, guy, Rusty, do you have something? I just want to say the the request for the mitigation plan. This is not the first time we've requested this. Okay. Whenever we have a stream buffer variance in the city, the immediate request from us is. You need to show you need to show how you're going to mitigate the impacts of the stream buffer, and it goes back to them, and we let them decide. Hey, are we going to move forward with the mitigation plan and vet this out to see if we can get the appropriate measures that we need in place, and can we afford that with the project that we're doing, before we even move forward to, um, to the license and variance board, and we always try to vet that out on the front end to make sure that what they're proposing works and is appropriate. And that has our support, then yeah, we'll move forward. We recommend approval and everybody's happy we're issuing the permit after LMB. If we don't get that mitigation plan, there's nothing to react to. For uh, at that point, our recommendation is denial because the, the ordinance itself says there has to be a mitigation for the impact to the ordinance. And if you remove that, then we gotta remove mitigation plans for almost everything else that would come down that side. So I understand what they're saying, but the request has been there from the start of this project to ask for that mitigation plan. They've got to hire an engineer to figure that out for them. Correct. And I, and Rusty, hopefully by my question to you doesn't, doesn't um, uh, 
presume you did not ask, but that wasn't part of the process. I want to be clear in a bit. We didn't wait to this point to try to get No, we understand that. Right. We understand right. that, but we're and here, I, and we, you know, I think you've got... Yeah, yeah, and I understand and I respect your, you know, I the process. Want, I want it on record for everything else. And I wanted That's to, fine. to Thank point you. out, they mentioned it's only 282 square feet, but all the impervious areas in the city are cumulative. Yeah. That's adding to your stormwater runoff. That's going to add to your flooding. That's going to add to the degradation of state waters. So it may be a small area here, but it's a cumulative effect in along the watershed. Please come on. I up. have a question. Come on, up. Come on. Um, up. He, he wants to respond first, Ms. No, Wilkins. Okay, my question. Okay, I'll can I can wait. I'll ask. Um. It, there almost seems to be like a, a cart before the horse thing going on here, as I'm hearing it. It's a, it's mitigation was proposed in the form of the pavers. That notion was shot down by the engineering office because they don't recognize that as being a valid part of mitigation. What the council is saying, if I'm understanding correctly, is no, staff needs to consider that as a potentially valid mitigation factor. If that's the case, we're perfectly happy to go back and create the mitigation plan and to use um, Councilman Gould's language, get in a room and hammer it out. Um, but what we would need is an understanding that, yeah, this is a potentially viable way to do things. If the concern is, well, you can't do it this close to the foundation because it's got the 15-foot buffer that we were talking about, a 15-foot differential on it. Like I said, it's 14.5 feet is what we're talking about. Instead of 15 feet, that, to use the language that was of concern over here, is a risk for the homeowner's consideration to be done in that circumstance. That 0.5 feet I'm willing to live with on this. So I, I understand the idea of being able to get into the room to propose mitigation. Um, I'm going to go back to the comment that was made. It's because of the unique challenges of the way the property is that it makes mitigation tough. And if they're going to a priori rule out a viable method of mitigation, that becomes problematic and will lead us back to the same point. Where we I are think here. you just need to make your best, you know, have an engineer analyze it and just ma and make your best recommendation. Yeah, and, and, and to the point that's being talked about, um, when you're talking about a water level control on something, I mean, it seems to me, I, I'm not an engineer on that point, but it seems to me the simple solution is, okay, you set the pool level slightly lower than it would be otherwise to give the rain a chance to get up to there and do the calculation that you would need, you know, a 100-year rain or a 500-year rain to go beyond that point. That's something that certainly can be done on the engineering side. Uh, I'm not worried about that particular aspect of it. Um, Council Wilkinson. Person Wilkinson. Um, well, my question was for um, the city attorney, um, Scott Cochran. Um, I know with a rezoning, if it's denied, there's a limit on um, uh, applying for another rezoning, but I guess what I'm looking at is this is a appeal of the denial of the decision by the License and Variance Board, and I, I guess my question is if, if we uh, voted on that and it was denied, are they allowed to come back uh, with their mitigation plan and work with the staff to come up with something that different. I think the I think the solution would be to table it yeah. and then give yeah, them the opportunity to come back with something before a formal vote is taken. Is that correct, Scott? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. what I'm hearing. Is this is there's is this, you guys would table it, sit down in a room, come up with the mitigation plan, bring it back. Understood. Yeah. Is that Mr. Gould? This is in your war. Is that favorable? Sure. Yeah. Uh, tabling is fine. Is a. Uh, is acceptable. Did you have something else? Mr. The last point I just want to make on this with regard, and I'm going to turn to the precedent issue that you talked about also. Uh, this is all just a matter of public record also. The, the house that's immediately next to ours on the uphill slope, which is 1923 Sadler Drive, um, our lot is 0 .223, thank you, 0 .223 acres. The lot immediately next to ours is 0 .23 acres, so a differential of seven thousandths of an acre. The square footage of our house is roughly 3,100 square feet. The square footage of that house is over 5,000 square feet. This council, with all due respect, has already shown that it will allow for 
Well, square footage, it's got nothing to do with impervious soil. So the analogy is actually not very positive in my mind for your statement. <laughs> and because it's actually that. misleading and disingenuous. I, that, that's just my understanding on that. Yeah. But you, we're happy, to, like you said, to take the table and get in a room and see if we can hammer it out. But we don't know where, I was just wanting to say that we don't know where the stream buffer lines are in that property. That's, you know, to, to your point. Council. All right, uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a quick um, question, if it's, it's okay, um, for staff. Confirming that there were no actual plans, only verbal ideas of, of mitigation. So we would need something in a written document plan that we could approve, is that correct? Correct. Okay. I met on site with the representative from, uh, from the pool company. Okay. And to see the size of the lot, and during our conversation, <laughs> that this is a list of viable BMPs, but looking at the lot, I don't know where you can put them because of the space requirements and distance requirements. They would just need to, to give a, a written plan yeah, on um, mitigation. Plan. Okay. At a minimum for the written plan is a site plan showing the location of the mitigation and design specifications of the BMP. So how it operates and how it's designed. Um, it can't just be shown on a site plan, highlight an area and then say, we're doing pervious pavers. There's more to it than just that. So can, I think I'm I, sorry, can I yeah, pipe, pipe Ms. In Hines. For a second? Yes, hey. So is it possible then, based off of what Mr. Martin was saying, can you send Mr. Melnick what it is that he, he would need to submit to his engineer for them to look at to be able to come up with some type of mitigation plan and then you guys can get back together and and see what works out the best? Is that possible? I did provide them a list, correct? For mitigation, yeah. as I, I think what we're going to do, y'all, I think we've talked about this long enough. I think what we're going to do, I think we got a plan. I think Mr. Yeah, Gould is going to make a motion to table. I want Mr. Gould, staff, and y'all to get together and try to work this out. I think it's clear we have a lot of respect for our staff and their opinions. We also have a lot of respect for property rights and what you're trying to do, so we're going to try to make it work. Mr. Gould, I'll entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to uh, table item 4A 2022-481. Do I have a second? And do we need to have a date certain? Yeah, you need to table it to a specific date. Is a is it a month that would that be good or? Okay. So to one month. So the first meeting in November is what date, Miss Heather? <clears throat> okay. Like so to my motion, like to. Table item 4A 2022-481 to first meeting in November, November 7th. Okay, do I have a second? Looks like Ms. Hines is seconded. Okay, all those in favor, please vote. And that's approved 7-0. Thank y'all. Look forward to y'all getting together and, and hopefully reaching a resolution. Item B, 2022-476, authorization for an apartment complex name change request for a change from Midwood Belmont Apartments to 1000 Belmont, 1000 Belmont Park Drive, Southeast Smyrna, Georgia, by the applicant Emma Menegas, who is the regional manager with 1000 Belmont Apartments, LLC, and authorized the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. This is just simple name change, Mr. Bennett, correct? correct. All right. This is in Ward 3. I'll turn it over to Mr. Lindley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Motion do pass as presented. Motion do pass, seconded by Mr. Pickens. All those in favor, please vote. Ms. Hines. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? All right, yay. In the affirmative. That's approved 7-0, thank you. I should note Ms. Hines is unable to be here and has joined us virtually, as you might have gathered. Number five is privileged licenses, we have none. Item six is formal business. 6A, ordinance 2022-19, second approval of charter amendment adopting the redistricting plan subsequent to the 2020 decennial census and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. Mr. Bennett, the background, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As a result of the 2020 census, the boundaries of the city of Smyrna, Georgia's seven council person wards require redistricting in accordance with applicable state and federal law. The mayor and city council, also known as the governing body of the city, have engaged redistricting legal experts and consultants to assist the city in its redistricting efforts. And the governing body now desires to amend the city charter to adopt this redistricting plan. The recommendation is to authorize the amendment of Article 3, Division 1, Section 6C of its charter of the Smyrna City Charter to adopt this redistricting plan made subsequent to the 2020 decennial census and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. This is our final vote, and then this will become effective um, if approved on January 1st, so it won't affect any of the the new wards won't be in effect uh, when all the November elections are going on. I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Lindley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Motion to pass on final approval. Have a motion. Have a second. Second by Mr. Pickens. All those in favor, please vote. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? I vote in the affirmative. Yay. Okay. And that's approved 7-0, thank you. Item B, 2022-483, authorization to amend the fiscal year 2023 adopted budget to increase contract labor expense in the engineering departmental budget by $105,000 for emergency or unbudgeted contract labor and increase the revenue budget in the insurance reimbursement account in the general fund by $105,000. Mr. Bennett, the background, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Public Works and the engineering department have had an inordinate inordinate amount of contract labor for emergency response this year. They're requesting a budget adjustment of $105,000 for contract labor in the engineering budget to cover these unplanned expenses while we pursue recompense through the representative insurance companies. Again, engineering and finance recommend the approval. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to our budget chair, Mr. Travis Lindley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Motion uh, do pass as presented. I have a Second. motion seconded by Mr. Welch. All those in favor, please vote. Ms. Hines? I vote in affirmative, yay. Okay. It's approved 7 0. Item C, 2022 488, approval of the purchase of a SEBA 7040 concrete crusher from Grinder Crusher Screen, 1772 Corn Road, Smyrna, Georgia, 30080 and the amount of $179,000 to be paid for out of the American Rescue Plan Act fund and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. I see we're buying local, that's good. Mr. Bennett, the background, please. Thank you, sir. Public Works has requested to purchase the SEBA 7040 Crusher from Grinder Crusher Screen. The Crusher would provide an alternative for the haul off of concrete and asphalt from city projects. This machine would allow the city to crush curb, gutter, sidewalk, and asphalt and repurpose for future water, sewer, storm drain, and roadway projects. The SEBA 7040 Crusher is sold exclusively in the United States by Grinder Crusher Screen. This machine is recommended as it comes with a camera allowing a one-man operation. The company is also located less than two and a half miles from public work, so repairs and maintenance may be performed quickly. It is a recommendation of purchasing in public works for the approval of the purchase. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. I'll turn this over to Mr. Glenn Pickens. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, 6C 2022 488. Have a motion. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Lindley. Any discussion? All those in favor, please vote. <coughs> Ms. Hines? I vote in the affirmative. Yay. Okay. That's approved 7 0. Thank you. Item D, 2022-440, approval to purchase seven 2023 Ford Police Interceptor Explorer vehicles and four 2022 Ford Explorer XLT administrative vehicles through the Hardy Family Ford, 1255 Charles Hardy Parkway, Dallas, Georgia, 30157 for the police department as part of the fiscal year 23 vehicle replacement fund at a total cost of $533,017.97 and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. Mr. Bennett, the background, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A total of 11 police fleet vehicles have been or will be taken out of service in fiscal year 23. 
Replacement vehicles were included in the fiscal year 23 vehicle replacement fund. The police department has authorized $532,000 in the fiscal year 23 replacement fund for the replacement of seven uniform patrol vehicles and four administrative vehicles. The vehicles are needed to replace fleet vehicles taken out of service as a result of damage sustained in accidents, age and or mileage, as well as guidance from the fleet manager. All vehicles will be purchased from Hardy Family Ford located at 1255 Charles Hardy Parkway, Dallas, Georgia, 30157, and all necessary emergency equipment purchased from Insight Public Sector, Graphics Shop, Dell EMC, and ProLogic ITS. In order to retain budgetary limits, the recommendation is to purchase all 11 vehicles, outfit four administrative vehicles, and three of the pursuit vehicles. Additional vehicles will be outfitted as funds are available. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Welch, you want to handle this one? I'll be happy to. I'll make a motion to approve uh, item 8, A, B, C, D. 6D. 6, excuse me. As presented. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Pickens. All those in favor, please vote. Ms. Hines. Vote in the affirmative. And that's approved 7 0. Item 7 is commercial berm, building permits. We don't have any. Item 8 is a consent agenda. Mr. Bennett, can you please read the consent agenda for council approval? Yes, sir. Item 8A, MIN 2022 67, approval of the September 15th, 2022 Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes. Item B, MIN 2022 68, approval of the September 19th, 2022 Pre Council Meeting Minutes. Item C, MIN 2022-69, approval of the September 19th, 2022 Mayor and Council Meeting Minutes. Item D, 2022-475, approval to use Council Chambers for a joint Town Hall meeting, Wards 1, 2, and 3, Tuesday, October 18th, 2022, from 7 p.m. at 7 p.m. at AMAX Bacon City Hall, 2800 King Street, Smyrna, Georgia, 30080. Item E, 2022-482. Approval to use council chambers for Heritage at Vining's Homeowners Association meeting to be held Wednesday, January 18th, 2023 from 7 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. Finally, item F, 2022-484. Authorize Atkins Park Tavern, Restaurant, and Bar to operate a beer trailer station at the Hispanic Heritage Celebration at the edge of Smyrna Market Village, immediately facing City Hall, off the street on October 15th, 2022, between 3 p.m. and prior to streets being cleared and open for vehicular traffic following the event, and authorize issuance of required letter, proof of authorization by the Office of the City Clerk for Atkins Park Tavern to obtain required state license. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. So moved by Mr. Lindley. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Pickens. All those in favor, please vote. Ms. Hines. So, uh, yeah, in the Okay. And that's approved 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Hines, for joining us virtually this evening. Uh, item nine is ward and committee reports. We'll start tonight with Mr. Glenn Pickens. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Just a reminder that there's a uh, joint town hall meeting next, or October 18th at 7 p.m. in this room for wards one, two, and three. Mr. Lindley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a, a reminder and hope everybody can come out for the uh, grand birthday celebration, uh, 150 years, so it's pretty amazing. And uh, I want to thank the uh, scouts that uh, stuck around. Y'all, uh, I don't know if you're being punished for being here this evening, but thank you all for being here. That's it. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You caught me a while ago looking up the date for this. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Bulk amnesty is on October the 22nd. If you got some, and, and I, this is important to me because I have some stuff around my house that needs to go. Uh, so um, bulk amnesty is October 22nd from eight to one o'clock at Smyrna Public Works. If you got some stuff that needs to be hauled off, take it down there and they'll take it. With that, I yield. Ms. Wilkinson. Uh, no report tonight. Mr. Gould. No report tonight, Mr. Mayor. Dr. Wheat. Uh, no report this evening, Mr. Mayor. No. No, sir. Thank you, though. Ms. Penny. Scott. 
Is Heather, you have anything? And all Jill wants to do is see Toad the Wet Sprocket on Saturday. All right. Now, item 10 is show cause hearings. We don't have any. Item 11 is citizen input. I don't think anybody signed up. Is there anybody that wants to say anything this evening? Yes, sir. I'll be brief. Uh, Barrett Carter, 4504 Oak Brook Drive in Smyrna. I just wanted to take a minute to thank mayor, members of the city council, staff for helping pull together recognition for Blair Berenson and his family. And I want to thank the members of Troop 220 for coming out to support Blair and his family for the project he did. Um, I just, I think it's important. Scouting is important. I believe in it. And I want to thank you all for taking the time on a relatively short notice to, to get the pictures and to get everything prepared so that we could recognize the family accordingly and mainly recognize Blair for his efforts. So thank you. Hope you're buying all them a big steak dinner tonight for staying. <laughs> all right if there's nobody else to speak uh, and no other business to be brought before this body we are adjourned at 8 11.